One Sunday after church, <coughs> they were counting the weekly offering, and the tellers and the pastor of this small church found a little pink envelope containing a thousand dollars in cash. It happened again the next week. So the following Sunday, the pastor watched as the offering was being gathered and saw an elderly woman put that distinctive pink envelope in the plate. This went on for a couple of weeks and finally the pastor, a little nosier than I am, <laughs> overcome by curiosity, approached her and said, Ma'am, I couldn't help but notice that you have been putting $1,000 a week in the offering plates. Well, yes, she said. Every week my son sends me some money and I get a part of it to the church. Pastor replied, well, that's wonderful, but $1,000, that's substantial. Are you sure you can afford that? How much does he send you? Well, she said, he sends me $10,000 a week. Oh, wow. The pastor said, your son is very successful. What does he do for a living? Oh, he's a veterinarian, she answered. Honorable profession, the pastor said, but I had no idea they made that kind of money. Where is his practice? Oh, the woman answered proudly. In Nevada, he has two cat houses, one in Vegas and one in Vegas. <laughs> story about money, right? <laughs> right. We began last time looking at our annual fee um, and talking about harvest to glean in 2015. And, and last time we talked about sowing seeds and the various kinds of soil. And we wrapped up saying how vital it is that we keep our lives uncluttered, that we keep our hearts tender and open to God's Word. This week we're going to move into an actual case study of what I would consider not just harvesting, but gleaning. Understand that harvesting gathers up the obvious parts of the crop. Gleaning, on the other hand, goes around the edges and gathers up those parts of the crop that would otherwise be missed. That's really an important thing to remember because this story is more about gleaning than it is about harvesting. And I just want to read a little bit to you from the message, which is a contemporary rending of the Bible, from John 4. Because the gospel lesson that we have, that couple of verses, come at the end of the chapter, but what comes before is tremendously important. John chapter 4, Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at that well. It was about noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone into town to get some food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, said, how is it that you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Parenthetically, the scripture says Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you not just a drink, but a river of flowing. They go on for 
over a few verses and they're arguing about who's better and where it is that, that people should worship. And Jesus stops and he says, go, call your husband and come back. And the woman says, well, I have no husband. Well, that's nicely put. Jesus said, I have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now isn't a husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, the woman said, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this. She goes on there. Our ancestors worshipped God in the mountain, but you Jews insist it's only in Jerusalem. And Jesus, at that time, gave her the truth that is so compelling for all of us. Jesus said, the day is coming when true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. The woman says, well, I don't know so much about that, but I do know Messiah is coming. And when he arrives, we get the whole story. And Jesus said, I am he. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. It was at that moment that the disciples came back and they were shocked. They couldn't believe Jesus was talking to that kind of a woman. No one said what they were thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left the water pot behind. Back in the village, she told the people, Come, see a man who told me all the things I'd ever done, who knew me inside out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they all gathered and went out to see for themselves. In the meantime, the disciples pressed Jesus, Rabbi, eat, aren't you hungry? And he told them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. The disciples, of course, taking it literally, thought somebody gave him lunch. And he said, the food that keeps me going is doing the will of the one who sent me and completing the work God asked me to do. Then comes this verse. As you look around right now, wouldn't you say that it's about four months till it will be time for the harvest? Well, I'm telling you, he said, open your eyes and take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. Now, I love several things about that story. And I want to talk about it in that context. It opens with the religious leaders doing what they like to do, and that's setting up competition. What ministry is bigger? What ministry is better? Which ministry has more conversions, more baptisms? Who has the biggest and best facilities? And when rivalry shows up in the body of Christ, Jesus leaves. That still happens today. Are we bigger or better than XYZ MCC is absolutely irrelevant. The question we need to ask is, are we being the best that we can be? John 4.4 4 said that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now, many of the Jews, because of prejudice toward the Samaritans, would travel across the Jordan. You didn't really have to. You could have gone through Perea, which is way out of the way, and they would go way out of their way in order not to have to deal with the Samaritans. Now, the direct route was three days, but to avoid the, the Samaritans took twice as long. Now, this hatred between Jews and Samaritans dates back to 720 BC when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom and carried off much of the population into captivity. Those who were left behind began to intermarry and began to take on the heathen practices and in the eyes of strict Jews that was absolutely unforgivable. But Jesus goes through that so-called enemy territory, to keep a chance appointment. It was noon. In his humanity, he was hot and tired, hungry and thirsty. In his divinity, he discerned that a troubled woman would be showing up. He sits down by the well and sends his disciples off to town to buy some food. And by the way, you know that something has already begun to be transformed in their lives, that they'd be willing to go do business with Samaritans. So there he sits, and here comes the woman. Now, it's a bit of a mystery why she came to that well. 
it was more than half a mile from the town in which she lived, my guess is that she was probably so much of an outcast that the other women of the village had shunned her and driven her away. Jesus takes the initiative and speaks first. Give me a drink. Well, she reels in astonishment. How is it that you, being a Jew, even talk to me? And the dialogue between them ensues. Let me just tell you something about the stories, the accounts from in the Bible. They're often like minutes of a meeting. You know, minutes cover hours of a meeting. And so there was probably more dialogue than we have. John has chosen to highlight what we need to know. The woman notices that Jesus doesn't have anything to draw with and that the well is deep. He comes back offering her living water and she says yes. He says, go get your husband. Oops. She says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you have five. And the person, the guy you're living with now, isn't a husband either. Then in verse 24, Jesus imparts to her that God is spirit and that the day is now, will come, he says, and the day is now, where we worship God in spirit and in truth. I will tell you that for a chunk of my life, I would go to churches where I could worship in spirit, but I didn't really worship in truth. You've ever been to a church where you're sitting there praying that the pastor doesn't get off on some tirade on Leviticus, or David and Jonathan, or Ruth and Naomi, or Deuteronomy, or Timothy, or Corinthians, or Romans 1? <laughs> there are lots of churches where we could theoretically worship in spirit. They're what I call check your lifestyle at the door churches. And you go in and you worship in spirit, but not in truth. Not until 1968 did a church arise where we can come integrated, fully being who we are, where we can worship not just in spirit, but in spirit and in truth. And that is what Jesus first told this outcast woman. The woman runs back, and by the way, the disciples come back, and the scripture, my translation says that they marveled that he was talking to this woman. But there's a hint in the original text that the disapproval was obvious. You know, sometimes you don't need to say a word. People can feel it, and she felt it. But she didn't let it stop her because the scripture says she runs back to town. She gathers up all of her exes and more. And she says, come on out here and see someone who has told me everything I've ever done. But what's important is there was no condemnation. It was simply a matter of someone knowing her inside and out, knowing all the secrets of her life, knowing her darkest deepest closet issues and inviting her to have living water and to worship in spirit and in truth anyway. So we might call her the first evangelist. They went out there to meet Jesus and the whole town found salvation. When the disciples start asking Jesus about eating, he said, my food is to do the will of God and to finish the work God gave me to do. And then the famous artist verse. <clears throat> so this is the context. What can we learn from this account about gleaning harvests? Number one, gleaning harvests happen in unexpected places. Sometimes we will end up somewhere unusual, somewhere out of the ordinary, Sometimes our paths will take a detour, often out of their comfort zone. Certainly for the disciples, but not for Jesus. This was out of their comfort zone. A place they never expected to be, and a place that once they were there, they did not expect any response. Secondly, there are people or persons you think might never 
be interested in the good news of God's unconditional love. Please never rule out anybody. I mean, can you imagine sharing the good news to someone like Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle? We sometimes think, oh, they wouldn't care. They wouldn't be interested. They've got it all together. But I really want you to get this. I want you to think about the barriers that Jesus broke down. First, here was a woman that was despised by his entire culture and religion. Jesus had grown up hating Samaritans. As far back as he could remember, they were to be avoided at all costs. The chasm between we the Jews and they the Samaritans, the us and thems, the chasm was huge, it was well established, virtually uncrossable. She was one of those people. So that she was a woman. The strict rabbis made it forbidden to even greet a woman in public. A rabbi could not even greet or speak to his own wife, sister, or daughter in public. There were among the Pharisees those they called the bleeding and bruised Pharisees because they shut their eyes if there was a woman anywhere around. And as such, they would run into walls and different things, and, you know, bruise and bleed. But for a rabbi to be seen speaking to a woman in public was the end. Did you do a good job of me running into a wall, Jenny? Something's going on over here. I can feel it. Yeah, could you, could you do it for me? Yeah. Bruised and bleeding Pharisee. Closed eyes, not to see me. She did. I knew she would do that well. She always does it well. Yes, so she does it For a rabbi to speak to a woman was the end of his reputation, and yet, and yet, that didn't stop Jesus. The third barrier was this was not just any woman. This was one of notorious character. No decent man, let alone a rabbi, would have been seen in her company or even exchanging a word with her. And yet, that didn't stop Jesus. To the Jews who were part of this amazing story, this was almost unfathomable. Here was the Son of God, tired and weary and thirsty. Here was the holiest of men, taking time to listen with compassion to this woman's story. Here was Jesus finding a harvest on the other side of nationality barriers, cultural and custom barriers, religious and gender barriers. Here is Jesus sharing the good news of God's unconditional love to a woman of ill repute, a woman with a scarlet past. A woman, someone who, like some of us, had not managed her love life very well. Obviously, Jesus knew it. And yet, and yet, he didn't make an issue of it. He refused to define her by her love life. Isn't that awesome? He refused to define her by her love life. The third thing about harvesting is this. The content of what you share is secondary to the tone in which you share it. The content is not nearly as important as the approach, the tone. If you offer salvation to someone looking down your nose at them, or in a condescending, judgmental way, you won't be heard. Trust me, I watch televangelists, and sometimes I just turn down and I just mute the sound, and their face says it all. But there was something about how Jesus spoke to this woman that was so compelling that she left her bucket, ran off to town, and gathered up all of her friends. And can you imagine what she would say? I can't believe it. Here is someone who knows everything about me and yet invited me in. Invited me to worship God in spirit and truth and offered me rivers 
of living water. So love reaches out, reaches beyond the things that won't matter in a hundred years, and Jesus here offers help and hope. Not condemnation, but invitation. Not put down, but lift up. Not shame on you, but celebrate with me. This woman, this very pretty, pretty loose living gal, especially in that time and place. Many failed relationships. I bet she had a list of ex-lovers that could put some of us to shame. Amen. And yet, and yet Jesus said, we're not going to leave her out. We're counting her in. And he challenges his closest followers to look around and see how ripe the harvest is. Right there in her hometown, a place they can scarcely imagine. Harvests don't always happen where we expect them. They don't always focus on those we think might be interested. And they often call us to overlook the very things, if we're not careful, we'll stumble over. If we are going to be effective in winning the harvest this year, then there's some lessons here we need to take to heart. Now, one might assume that a congregation of mostly marginalized people would be open and sensitive to other people who are struggling. In some cases, that would be a wrong assumption. You know, our founder, Reverend Troy Perry, says there's nothing worse than a bunch of self-righteous queers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what he means is that if we're not careful, we just might gather all this good stuff in and tend to keep it. There are all sorts of stories surrounding wars in every era. But in France, and I don't know if it's true, the story is told of some soldiers who brought back the body of one of their dead comrades to a, a French cemetery to have him buried. They met with the priest of that parish, and the priest was said, I'm compelled to ask if your comrade was a baptized adherent to the Roman Catholic Church. They said, we're not sure, we don't know. And the priest said, well, in that case, I can't let you bury him here in our churchyard. So the soldiers left with sadness and took the body of their friend and buried him right outside the fence. The next day, they got up and came with some flowers to decorate the grave and to check on it. And they looked and they looked and they looked and they couldn't find it. There was no trace of freshly dug soil. They were a little bit bewildered and dismayed and almost ready to leave when the priest came out and called to them. He told them that all night he'd been troubled by his refusal to let them bury their friend in the yard. So in the wee hours of the morning, he got up and with his own hands, he had moved the fence. That's what Jesus did in his time of harvest. He moved fences to include a wider group of people than even we can imagine. As his followers today, he's asking you to do the same thing.